Welcome everyone to another session of Emerging Issues and Seminar Series. And this time, it's a little bit more special than the usual one. Every, everything, every session is special, but this one is a tiny bit more special because we will be doing a panel discussion and, uh, on the topic uh, Ukraine one year later, exactly after one year since we had the previous panel discussion. Uh, we are here, uh, kindly joined by Dr. Matthew. President, he, he doesn't require any specific introduction to the GSD universe, but still someone who specialized, who has more than three decades of uh, experience with the United Nations in uh, war conflicts, uh, particularly in Somalia, Liberia, and we also know him to be the one who negotiated the cessation of fossil free uh, agreement in Sarajevo. So we'll be starting with uh, Dr. Matthew, and then we'll move on to uh, our professor Desires, who's also who also does not require much of introduction, but since we have guests, the Sarval School students from Sarval School, I'll go again and introduce Professor Desires as well, who has a JD from Harvard Law School and a PhD as well. Uh, he was a UN independent expert on promotion of democratic and equitable international order by UN human rights. Decades of experience in the UN system as well, especially in human. Rights. So, welcome to you, Professor Desires. Thank you. And another person who also does not require much introduction, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Dr. Alexander Likotal. Um, he was the former president of Green Cross International, an organization that many of us know. He holds a PhD in history from MDMO and a senior doctorate in political science from the Institute of World Economy and International Relations. Uh, in addition to an academic career, he served as a European security analyst for Soviet Union leadership and was deputy spokesman and advisor to the president of UNF USSR. So another person who has total license to say and give his feedback on what's happening at the moment. Uh, without further ado, I am inviting Dr. Murphy to share his thoughts on the on the current topic uh, that we are that we'll be discussing today. So. Welcome, Dr. Murphy. So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's more than disappointing to know that an entire year has passed since we gathered in this fashion because of what was then the shocking and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine by uh, Mr. Putin. Um, what can I say? All wars are based on fear and ignorance. So I'd like to start by saying a few words about Mr. Putin's ignorance. He is almost totally uneducated. Yes, he knows how to read and write. He has a quick gangster understanding of street matters. He's very good with numbers, which has enabled him to steal so much that he's now one of the richest people in the world. He's also very afraid. And people around him, even they have reported that he watches the video over and over and over again of the fall of the fall of Bahamar Gaddafi. And so when the protests first began in uh, Moscow and in Ukraine, um, he disappeared again for a long time because he fears people, the, the democratic world is li little by little coming for him, which it is. Before I forget, the first lesson I want to, the only lesson really I want to uh, articulate this afternoon to all our students is Please do not be overly afraid of tyrants and dictators. It takes a little courage, but who knows, in your future, you may be called from the ranks and your courage tested. Don't be afraid to speak up in defense of UN values. And we at the Geneva School of Diplomacy are solidly loyal to UN values. That's what we promote. That's what we... Uh, 
protect, that's what we advance, that's what we teach. And um, we are in a democracy, remember, and in a place of academic freedom of speech, um, unlike people increasingly in Putin's regime. I want to say at the beginning, too, that diplomacy is not just talking. I see more and more articles appearing. Maybe diplomacy has the answer for what's happening in Ukraine, rather than military. Well, the two things are not to be separated. Force is also a part of diplomacy. Dialogue is very important, but so is force. Mahatma Gandhi, for example, the great champion of peace, a man to be honored forever, was an expert in the use of force. Not violence, never violence, but force, yes. So, as with his uh, follower, ultimately, Martin Luther King, Jr., force in the, in the, in the, in the uh, form of sit-down strikes, mass meetings, protests, the use of media, all of these things are the use of force, but not violence. However, um, the brave Ukraine, Ukrainian people have had no choice but to resist militarily and with force and with the violence that Putin opens. One could encapsulate that by saying or remembering what President Theodore Roosevelt said. If you live in a dangerous neighborhood, speak softly and carry a big stick. So force and dialogue go together. I can think of two things in Ukraine's background that alone uh, give them the right to their independence that they fully deserve. One was a terrible man-made famine launched by Stalin in 1932 and 1933. He decided that all of um, USSR should be collectivized, agriculture should be collectivized, and the peasants in Ukraine regarded this, they resisted, they regarded this as a return to serfdom. So Stalin launched a deliberate man-made famine against them and cut off all of Ukraine's access to things to eat. So the breadbasket, if you will, of much of the region was shut down their grain, their wheat, and so on was taken away, and they were locked in to the famine created by Stalin, and the result was some four million Ukrainians died of famine. It's called the Holodomor, and the word implies not just death from starvation, but a deliberate killing by starvation. So we all hear often of the six million Jews who died during the Holocaust. And we should hear again and again and again about that. Evil that it was. One of the most evil things of history. But we also need to familiarize ourselves with the four million, for example, Ukrainians who died in this terror famine, as it was caused, as it was called, as launched by Stalin. Precisely because of that, if for no other reason, Ukraine merits its freedom and has more than deserved to maintain its independence. When I was a young political officer at the UN in New York, I was very surprised uh, at my first encounter with the UN to see that Russia had three votes, whereas every other country had one vote. And the Russian mission told us, well, that's because uh, Ukraine is an independent country, they said. Belarus is an independent country, they said. But they are brothers who vote with us. All of a sudden, they're telling us that Ukraine is not independent and never was. Which is quite wrong, wrong because, in fact, Ukraine was annexed into the Russian Empire only in seven 
There's another incident I would like to mention among the many that have caused so much suffering in Ukraine. And that was the deportation from Crimea of its indigenous people, the Tatars. This took place in 1932-1933, when Stalin again decided that um, Crimea should be cleansed, ethnically cleansed, of its indigenous people. He gave the task to his head of security, Lavrenti Beria, a decadent, perverted sadist who accomplished this in three days. He took with him some 37,000 NKVD agents, the predecessors of the KGB, to Crimea. And Tatar families all over the Crimea were given exactly 15 minutes to say goodbye to their homes, take a few personal possessions, some warm clothes, uh, some documents perhaps, before they were brutally pushed into filthy cattle cars and transported thousands of kilometers away to Uzbekistan. Beria reported to Stalin after three days that some 200,000 Tatars had been removed this way. In fact, the exact figure is 199,044 Tatars sent to Uzbekistan. And when they got there in their new settlement, uh, they discovered, of course, that some 9,000 of them had died on the terrible trip. Nor were they even free there. They were surrounded by barbed wire and armed guards. And that alone is every reason for Ukraine to say, enough of this, never again, never again, ever. I spoke to friends in Ukraine yesterday. And I could actually hear the shelling that was going on. Putin is shelling residential areas, apartment blocks. He shells hospitals, clinics, maternity wards, schools. And he did this the day before, and the day before, and the day before, and the day before that. And the week before, and the week before, and last month, and the month before that. A massive series of war criminals, of war crimes for which he will be indicted one way or another. I have a note here that says that maybe I should mention to you that I have, by accident or whatever, or fate, dealt with numbers of war criminals. Sat with them over lunch, over dinner, monsters who are now serving long prison terms. They are, at least in my limited experience, I'm talking about five or six or seven main ones and about 25 others who are serving long terms. All of them, in my limited experience, are extremely uninteresting, boring people. And perhaps to compensate for their inadequacies, they have made themselves infamous, uh, their names not to be forgotten because of the terrible crimes they commit. Putin and his background. He was um, a low to mid-level KGB agent. Um, he has never been seen to be intellectual or of particularly great talent. He was sent to a backwater, uh, Dresden, during his time as a KGB agent, where he spent time uh, doing things like cutting out newspaper articles and sending them to the Kremlin. When I worked in the UN in New York, I was surprised because a number of people on our floor, the 35th floor, were clearly KGB agents. And at that time, copy machines, photocopy machines, were frequently under lock and key in Russia. They were thrilled to find that there was a photocopy machine, as in most offices here, that was not under lock and key. And they were obliged to report to the Russian mission every month as to whether they were diligently spying on the West. So they would go and make photocopies of the New York Times. This article and that article, and that takes care of my, my uh, task for this month. And we wondered, laughing, why they don't just subscribe to the New York Times <laughs> and get it sent to them in the mail. 
All this to say that Mr. Putin has a conspiratorial mindset. He's simply unable to imagine that all those thousands of people who protested uh, in Moscow, Russia, Bez, Putin, Russia without Putin, he's certain that they were paid by the CIA. As he's certain that the protests in Kiev on the Maidan were, of course, not spontaneous. According to him, um, they were all paid by the CIA and planned in Washington. And he deeply resents, because he's a man grudge-driven, he deeply resents that what he thinks of as Western values are being pushed on Russia. But they are not Western values, they are universal values. And one of the original signatories of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, perhaps one of the greatest documents ever produced by humans, one of the signatories is Russia. And Russia is a founding member of the United Nations. So is it that what I'm saying is anti-Russian? On the contrary, it is pro-Russian, pro-Russian, pro-Russian. But the long-suffering Russian people deserve better leadership than this killer, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. How long will this go on? First of all, we in the Geneva School of Diplomacy are small, but we will always, in our small or modest way, add our voice to the cause of freedom of the people of Ukraine. And as long as I am here, we will always criticize the Putins of the world. And my lesson to the students today is, Please do not be overly frightened of tyrants or dictators. They are humans and they are mortal like the rest of us. And they hate being made fun of. I once spent several years meeting frequently with Dr. Radovan Kavadzic. He's now serving a life sentence in The Hague in the UN prison there. Um, I tried to get inside his head, and he was trying to get inside my head. And in my research and background work, I spoke even to former colleagues of his, people who had worked with him, lived with him, grown up with him. And they told me uh, how, he, how he thought, how he functioned, all sorts of odd facts, like he becomes very neurotic in the spring and in the autumn. And he's more balanced and more aggressive in summer and winter. I also realized that for tanks to move on the battlefield, obviously mud and snow are not the best. So we can expect in Ukraine again, uh, a hotting up of this terrible conflict uh, next month and the month of May, which will be critical. And I, for one, are very much in favor, not that my voice is important, it's not, but it's my voice. I'm in favor of the West uh, acting more efficiently in sending weaponry. Not this um, one day late and a dollar short. I'm in favor of sending to Ukraine, and again, my voice is not important. More MiG-29s, HIMARS, Patriot ground-to-air missiles, Stingers, Javelins, and far, 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 far more ammunition. And yes, even F-16 uh, fighter aircraft. Now, since we're in a place of uh, free speech, um, my distinguished colleague here, <laughs> Professor Desires, and he and I often disagree, but that's okay. That's called um, free speech. So we may end up disagreeing later this afternoon. <laughs> um, but that'll, that'll add a little amusement. Dictators also should uh, be made fun of. When I was driving here today, I was thinking of Mr. Putin. What a waste of time. <laughs> and, um, you know, I came to the conclusion, it's my view anyway, that he was bored. Because he had already almost accidentally become one of the richest men in the world. And he had all, already also gained enormous power. The power came almost accidentally to him because he was plucked from nowhere by President Yeltsin 
to be prime minister. They didn't really do a great due diligence on him. And one of the people interviewed said, well, we like him because he's sober. <laughs> um, he also became very wealthy almost by accident because as head of the FSB, um, he was supposed to deal with the impudence of the oligarchs. And he had the brilliant idea, almost accidentally, of saying to them, OK, I'll protect you from the law, but I get 50%. So he gets 50% of all the theft and even some honest money earned by the oligarchs. He's phenomenally wealthy. So he just turned 70 recently and he has uh, a new wife who has been living in Switzerland and four young children. And my assessment, which may be totally inaccurate, is that he promised his family he'd soon be with them. He just had one more thing to do, and that was to bring Ukraine to heel. So just take a few weeks. It's a year later. And he has, without empathy, sent the flower of Russia's young manhood to their deaths. The figure I've heard is of young soldiers, uh, Russian soldiers, killed and wounded so that they're out of the battle is around 173,000. And he's been sending them into battle without preparation, without proper weapons. They've often been told to dig trenches with their own hands. And they don't even have warm clothing. And when they first tried to attack Kiev, and they had that long line of uh, tanks and armored vehicles heading towards Kiev, they discovered, oh my goodness, we forgot fuel. So the tanks and the column came to a halt until they, they could get a, a fuel. And of course, the column provided a perfect target for the Ukrainian military. But then they discovered the Russians, oh dear, we forgot food. The soldiers often didn't, the Russian soldiers often had no food, no fuel, no proper weaponry, no proper preparation. And Putin thought Kiev would fall and he would be happy to see President Zelensky dead in a matter of days or weeks. And my own view of President Zelensky is that he's a, a great leader, a very great leader. Uh, Mr. Putin is no leader at all. Think of Putin's own tasks and the goals he has set himself to diminish the power of NATO. He has caused NATO to expand with Sweden and Finland uh, as candidates now to join NATO. He announced that he would deal with the regime in Kyiv very quickly. It's a year later, and he hasn't. He vaunted the great Russian military, and they have behaved so badly, it's hard to believe, even a shock to the West. Again, I want to say that this is not anti-Russian. The Russian people want what every people in the world want, and they deserve better leaders. They want to live in places where they're at peace in their village, at peace with their community, at peace in their families, and at peace with their neighbors, where they can raise their children to be the best that they can be, uh, in confidence, and relaxation, and with the possibility, or at least a decent possibility, to be the best that they can be, and improve their lives if possible. Instead, Putin controls television. So he has been telling the Russian people all of these lies um, about how Ukraine is run by Nazis. There are no Nazis in Ukraine. There are no Nazis in Ukraine. Or to be more accurate, there are as many Nazis in Ukraine as there are giraffes in Russia. Yes, you could travel Russia from one end to the other and never see a giraffe. But if you really wanted to, you probably could collect some from different zoos. So if you had to find a few Nazis in Ukraine, you probably could. But it 
is a deliberate lie to the Russian people that in some way Ukraine is directed by drug addicts and Nazis. He's quite wrong, Putin. And he loves the Russian people so much that he lies to them all the time. Even worse, and again, one can say so many good things about Russia. I was once asked, can you think of a one single word that relates to the country Russia? And my answer was suffering. Stalin murdered more than 20 million people. 20 million Russians, more than 20 million. I've just mentioned uh, the 4 million Ukrainians killed in the terror famine. Mr. Putin sends young men to their deaths and continues every day, including today, in shelling residential areas in Ukraine. But what a sacrilege to take something like uh, Stalingrad, where Russians showed the world what bravery was all about, or their victory at the Battle of the Kursk Salient. What a blasphemy to take that and tell the Russian people that now they are fighting Nazis in Ukraine. It's a way of besmirching the great heroism of Stalingrad or the Battle of the Kursk Salient. And constantly Putin is saying that we are the same people, Ukrainians and Russians. Well, he loves the Ukrainians so much that he kills them every day. And he loves the Russian people so much that he sends their young men to die constantly. And he lies to the public. I have heard numbers of times about how the West was encroaching on uh, Russian security and they were betrayed and as a matter of fact after the Cold War the West poured millions and millions and millions of dollars into Russia to help um, wind down the Cold War and help Russia to get back on its feet again after the Yeltsin years. But in Putin's mind these are Western values being forced on Russia but they're not Western values. They are universal values as signed on to by Russia with the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. They are not Western values. They are values that belong to all of us and they belong to the Russian people. Um, yes, we should not forget our sense of humor. When I was driving here, I was wondering what one should put on Putin's uh, tomb eventually. Since he attained the wealth that he never imagined he could, he would have been happy to end up as Al Capone in charge of the underworld in St. Petersburg. And if he had been a kind of gangster of a region, instead he ends up as president of the Russian Federation. And so he has told his family, I just have this one last thing to do, you know, where I'll be a Tsar. He sees himself as a Tsar and he's going to rebuild he thinks, the Russian Empire. It's very interesting to think of these people in their ignorance who want to rebuild something that never existed. In the United States, we had Donald Trump saying, make America great again. Well, America is already great. But he, what he really means, Trump, is make America white again. Same with Putin. He wants to rebuild um, a Russian empire that was not as he imagined it. As a matter of fact, when Putin was a young KGB officer, um, that's what he harks back to and wants to make Russia great again. Um, in his view, Russia then was respected respected and now they're not respected anymore but he's wrong about that because Russia was not respected it was feared and much of the world regarded Russia and its great people as socially speaking upper Volta with rockets but he talks all the time Putin about respect we don't get any respect we don't get any respect you know who uses the word respect regularly the mafia 
don't get no respect. So we gotta kill this guy, we gotta kill this guy. Because we don't get no respect. Putin would have earned far more respect if he had led the Russian people who deserve it more towards democracy, more towards an open society, with free and fair elections, if he had improved the economy, and if he had ensured that uh, Russians increase their standard of living and the ability to live in peace and in dignity. It's not the first time in history that there's been a, a, a contrast between open and closed societies. It's the great classic divide uh, throughout history. My colleagues are amused when I mention the Peloponnesian War in the 5th century BC. When Athens, an open democratic society which invented democracy, fought for 27 years against Sparta, a closed militaristic society without culture and with no respect for human rights. Sparta, unfortunately, won. And in the modern Cold War just finished, it was the West that won against the Soviet Union and its allies. So the score is one all which means that the battle for an open society remains still ahead of us. And across the horizon, we see China, a closed society, growing steadily in power. So if we want to hold on to an open society where um, respect doesn't, isn't measured by the number of nuclear weapons you have, but by the welfare of its citizens, then we must be careful and we must always speak up against tyranny and dictatorship. Anyway, Putin was himself amazed to be so wealthy and amazed at the amount of power that he had. So now he would finish off his life as the Tsar that he wants to be. And I amused myself by saying, you know, what could we put on the gentlemen's too? Because, you know, they're mortal. Dictators and tyrants disappear like everybody. So I thought of the following. We could put on his uh, tombstone if we want. Here lie the bones of a would-be Tsar. His greed was greater than his skill by far. He sought to be the biggest in the farm barnyard. So that is the end that lies in front of us all. Future historians, including the most uh, eminent Russian okay. historians, and the most knowledgeable Russian historians, and the most educated okay. Russian Merci historians, beaucoup, will give Putin very bon bad journey. marks, bad grades. Yeah. They will fail him. They will say not that he rebuilt the empire. They will say that he's the man who held back Russians for decades from what they all want and deserve, to live in peace with their families and uh, towards fulfillment. And since I mentioned the Peloponnesian War, I'll finish with Plato, the great philosopher Plato. He was also one who wanted to rebuild an imagined past. His greatest book, The Republic, is actually um, a blueprint for the ideal society, and it reads awfully uh, like a description of Sparta. It has been fashionable to quote Plato by people who've never read him. But Plato was an aristocrat who didn't like the advent of democracy and wanted to see Athens great again, as he imagined it, so that he'd have back his privileges. If he were here today, he'd be wearing a blue hat or a blue baseball cap marked, Make Athens Great Again. <laughs> and then the blue and uh, Mr. Putin and Mr. Uh, Trump's red would together make up the Russian flag. I want to conclude by saying this. Seven decades ago, because we meet in the neighborhood of the United Nations, which we totally support, Seven decades and seven days ago, 
our forefathers and mothers created the United Nations to save your generation and succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in one lifetime brought untold sorrow to humankind. They created the UN to sustain human rights and the sacred dignity of each and every individual on the planet, and that means Russian and Ukrainian. So, um, we are still finding ourselves having to fight for those values. But I, for one, and the Geneva School of Diplomacy, whatever, in whatever modest way, is in favor of <clears throat> Ukrainian uh, independence and freedom, and at the moment perceives Ukraine as the senior century at the gate, literally. And our wish is that uh, Ukraine have the courage, as it does, to continue so that we see a free world and a Ukraine that is free, governed by Ukrainians, of Ukrainians, and for Ukrainians, so that they, neither of them, shall perish from the earth. Thank you very much. Chancellor Scholz recently said an interesting uh, words uh, uh, in an interview in Dagesh, uh, what was it, uh, Dagesh Figet, yes. He said that I would like Mr. Putin to answer one question. How are we getting out of this terrible situation? You know, I'm afraid he got the wrong address for this question. Because this is not the person who would be really interested in finding the answer to this question. And yesterday's um, accident, they call it an accident in the Black Sea, it, uh, in my judgment, it shows simply that Putin decided to escalate the situation. So if one wants to escalate the situation, that doesn't mean that he's going to look for a peaceful solutions. The outcome, the general outcome of the Russian uh, war against Ukraine is generally clear. Russia will lose the war. And moreover, it's already losing the war. I'm not talking about being crushed on the battlefield or anything like that. For me, the war has certain political goals, strategic goals. And if they are not fulfilled, that means that you lose them. And now it is absolutely clear that Russia will not be able to achieve the political objective which the war has started with. Moscow does not have the strength to turn Ukraine into a protector of Russia and deploy strike groups on the borders between Ukraine and Romania and Ukraine and Moldova. At the same time, Kremlin dragged the country into a, a 
bilateral confrontation with all of the West. Now, with the, as they say, with the collective West in Russia. And it's obviously, it's not able to win this confrontation. Suffice it to say that in terms of GDP, Russia is dozens of times smaller than the group of these countries. And the same goes for research and development, which is the most important thing in terms of the military power today. However, these and other factors of Russia's lagging behind uh, the West, and I would say China as well, Although they are obvious that these factors are working very slowly. And uh, in a protracted war, the balance of power, unfortunately, is in Russia's favor. And we should not just close our eyes. In 2021, the last year before the war, Russia's GDP was 9 times bigger than Ukraine. Before the war, the Russian population was three times larger than the population of Ukraine. Russia's territory is still practically untouched, whereas Ukrainian territory has suffered a lot during that period. Uh, the defense sector I mean, the factories of Russia operate around the clock. In Ukraine, the most of the defense sector has been destroyed. Putin has promised to spend as much as it takes to supply the troops. And on April the 1st, ahead in a couple of weeks, according to various speculation officially, of course, it is not announced and will never be announced. But they expect that on the 1st of April, the Defense Ministry will begin a new recruitment of the contracted servicemen. It is planned to add 400,000. Obviously, Ukraine doesn't have such almost inexhaustible manpower source. Is it economically feasible? From February 24th last year to March 7th this year, Russia earned 300, over 300 billion dollars from export of fossil fuels despite of any sanction. There are four reasons why Putin has so far been able to shrug off, to a certain extent, the Western sanctions. First, sanctions damage amounts to roughly $500 million a day. However, much uh, of uh, in 2022, Russia has been collecting 800 million every day on the energy sales. Second, countries that represent roughly 40% of the global economic output are still willing to do business with Moscow. Globalization funerals were a bit, let me say, premature. Third and fourth, Russia's economy has been battled, hardened during that period, and it has been, to a certain extent, transferred to the economic war, wartime cycles. And elites, until today, remain loyal to Putin. However, Russian military and private military contract 
Church forces have likely suffered as uh, Fulham said uh, from uh, roughly 175,000 to 200,000 casualties and uh, a part of that is <coughs> roughly between 40 and 60,000 are were killed. The Ukrainians, according to the same sources in the Western, in the NATO for Western intelligence, say that Ukraine has suffered similar losses, though Ukrainian authorities deny the large losses in the ranks of the Ukrainian army, as well as Russia denies this. Ukraine is now effectively under the tutelage of the United States and European and NATO. Despite the bravery, the resilience of the Ukrainian people, and this can be simply amazed and be a matter of pride for human ability, their ability to fight depends on the Western support. The country is suffering from a ruthless Russian bombing. The economy has suffered catastrophic damage. According to the international economic agencies, it has lost more than 30% of its economic might during the first year. The cost of rebuilding is projected now to over $1 trillion of the economy only. Millions of citizens have fled, and many have fled for good. The war is a terrible burden for the people of Ukraine, for the Russian people as well. But I'm speaking about Ukraine because Russia has supported what was being done. I appreciate what what President said about the Russian people making the uh, separation between the people and Putin, but I'm afraid it's still a question to be researched whether it was Putin who broke the backbone of Russia or whether it was Russia that broke the backbone of Putin. And I'm saying that because of all that, Ukraine has suffered so terrible sacrifices that, it, that are hardly entirely replenishable because destruction of the foundations of the economy because of the demographic effect of the losses of the people and even the culture. This is why I must say there is no price I would call exorbitant that cannot be paid to hold this destruction including by giving up parts of the territories. Many nations have gone through this ordeal, let me say, and in the end emerged victorious. Finland is a well-known example, but in reality there are great many more countries that has gone. So if I believe that giving up trying to reclaim territories that are under the Russian occupation would lead to the end of the war and prevention of further casualties, I would not hesitate to support this option. But the problem, I do not believe. Alas, the situation today is such that neither giving up one's own territories other concessions to the grant can bring Ukraine lasting, even temporary peace. In order to understand this, one must take a closer look at the nature of the war and the goals of Putin and Russia. This war cannot be compared uh, with any original conflict over disputed territories. Not 
nation. But even then, the very concept of victory that we have in our minds can be sense of compassion is not, you know, uh, corrupted. I think that ending the war is just a political decision, a matter of political choice, and that Ukraine has some better choices today. I'm afraid this is not so. Needless to say, I also sometimes think that way, because it might work so many people die. But it's sober and impartial. Analysis allows to think Ukraine has no such choice. As the main protagonist of the famous serial you probably all saw that the Medici said, you always have a choice if you're ready to lose. If Ukraine is not ready to lose, its only choice is to gnaw its teeth in its own land and water it abundantly with blood. And it was not Ukraine's choice. This is what the price of freedom turned out to be for Ukraine. There is no velvet option as enjoyed by neighbors to the West. Will the U.S. and Europe drink this cup to the bottom? I do not have an answer to this question. Thank you. Next would be our professor, Arthur Desaias. Would you like to press him from there, please? year of dying. Too many deaths, too many victims. I am uh, reminded of uh, Wilfred Owen and his uh, famous poem, 1917 uh, anthem for Doom Duke. The flower of Ukrainian and uh, Russian youth has been sacrificed uh, in this absolutely mad exercise. And uh, we, of course, all, Dr. Murphy, Dr. Likotow, myself, all want and pray for one thing, which is an end of this war. The question is how to get there. Uh, we all want uh, peace with justice. We all want uh, peace and human dignity. How to get there. Uh, I do not indulge in any wishful thinking, nor do I expect this war to end anytime soon. On the other hand, more and more intellectuals are calling uh, for some kind of a mediation, some kind of a uh, discussion. First, for instance, uh, Wolfgang Ischinger, the uh, director of the uh, Munich Security Conference for many years uh, has called for such a contact group. But he's not the only one. Uh, already, pretty early on, Pope uh, Francis uh, made several proposals for peace and he's offered his uh, good offices, he's offered his mediation. Uh, more recently, uh, President Lopez Obrador of uh, Mexico uh, has made some concrete proposals and uh, President Lula of um, Brazil who has uh, spoken uh, with uh, Zelensky and with Putin, both of them, uh, 
uh, and he is actually moving forward with an idea of establishing a club uh, of peacemakers, a club of uh, presidents, most of them from the global south, who are not concerned uh, with uh, this war. As a matter of fact, the global south, whether it be Latin America or Asia or Africa, Essentially, they consider the Ukraine war a European corral, a European uh, dispute, and for most Latin Americans, Africans, and Asians, uh, it is wholly irrelevant whether Crimea lies in Russia or in Ukraine. And of course, you cannot risk the planet and the survival of humanity uh, over this corrupt. So what has to be done is mediate as soon as possible. And we had uh, various mediation attempts and actually rather successful because uh, President Erdogan of uh, Turkey uh, did have uh, a valid, manageable, uh, compromise uh, back in March of uh, uh, last year, 2022, and uh, that was unfortunately torpedo. Following that, it was the Israeli Prime Minister Bennett, who also uh, negotiated directly. There were actually 17 drafts of that agreement. Uh, that was negotiated by Bennett. And uh, at the last minute, uh, Chelinsky <coughs> did not sign it because Zelensky was told more or less, don't sign it because you're going to win the war. Now, that is a year ago. This reminds me of another experience, uh, one that I made myself in Venezuela, when I was the first UN rapporteur in 21 years to go to Venezuela. And there, I spoke with the opposition, with uh, Julio Borges, uh, with um, uh, Leopoldo Lopez, etc., etc. And I spoke, of course, uh, uh, with the government and with the churches and with the diplomats, etc., etc. So my idea is what Venezuela needed was uh, an agreement on both sides, and the agreement had been reached, had been mediated by. Uh, Jose Luis uh, Rodriguez Zapatero, the former Prime Minister of Spain. Now, the day of signature, uh, Julio Borges was called and he was told, no firme, don't sign. Because he was promised that he would be in the driver's seat and he didn't have to negotiate with these criminals, uh, with these uh, corrupt uh, Nicolas Maduro, et cetera, et cetera. So that was over five years ago now. And uh, so there must be really on all sides uh, good faith and really a genuine effort at uh, reaching uh, a viable uh, agreement. Uh, I am particularly worried for every single soldier and civilian who has died already and those who will die today and tomorrow and next week and next month. So I would be uh, very, very concerned if this uh, war is continued through escalation and then another escalation because we're dealing here with uh, a nuclear power. Uh, that has more nuclear warheads than anybody else, more than the U.S., and has the means to deliver. And you know that uh, in a uh, case of the uh, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, there's very little time, actually. If your computer tells you that uh, the enemy has uh, fired intercontinental ballistic missiles against you, uh, you only have 15 minutes or so to react. Uh, and uh, of course, those missiles would 
be aimed not only at cities, it would be aimed at your own intercontinental ballistic missile. So if you don't use them, you lose them. So you have to use them. So uh, there is a, an enormous risk for the planet. And uh, that's why this is not comparable, say, with the Second World War. In the Second World War, it was only in August 45 that the United States threw the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, of course, the United States would have thrown it on Berlin uh, if they had, had it early. But if the Germans had not uh, unconditionally surrendered. Now, this uh, idea of unconditional surrender uh, from the Casablanca conference, uh, that is a, a one-time affair. But it's something that you cannot expect to have any validity if you're dealing with nuclear powers. Uh, allow me to quote from uh, one of my favorite American presidents. And this is a uh, commencement address that he gave at American University in uh, 1963 on 10 June. And uh, he had gone through the tension of the uh, October 62, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and he had thought about it a lot. So, what does he tell the students? Above all, while defending our own vital interests, nuclear powers must avert those confrontations which bring an adversary to a choice of either a humiliating retreat or a nuclear war. To adopt that kind of a course in the nuclear age would be evidence only of the bankruptcy of our policy or of a collective death wish for the world. Now, John F. Kennedy, uh, 10 June 1963. Now, I think it's important to focus on commonalities and see what we have in common with the Russians and how we can actually reach some sort of a compromise. And by the way, no one is going to win this war. It's losers on both sides. As indeed, if you remember the Iran-Iraq War of 1980 to 1988, it was horrendous that war. The war crimes that were committed in that war are just mind-boggling. Eight years of war, more than a million deaths, and in the end, they gave up, and uh, they they stopped fighting. So, uh, if that was the case then, how about uh, trying to stop the fighting now, and try to reach a reasonable uh, compromise? Now, there have been many blueprints for peace. I myself formulated one and I published it in uh, my uh, book, Countering Mainstream Narratives. And um, there was a very strong one from Frederick uh, Heppermel of the uh, Nobel uh, Peace Prize Watch Committee. And um, that was in May of last year. There was also a very good one from the International Progress uh, Organization in Vienna. Um, and uh, those two would have been viable. Now, the most uh, important one, I would say, uh, that is likely uh, to have some uh, traction is actually the Chinese proposal. Uh, the Chinese have the weight, they have the clout, uh, they have the influence, and uh, let me see whether I find it here. It's a 12-point uh, uh, proposal, and uh, very briefly, of course, res respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity, uh, equal and uniform application of international law, the security of a country should not be pursued at the expense of others. You have to forge a balanced, effective, and sustainable European security architecture. You have to prevent uh, block 
uh, confrontation. Uh, as far as the cessation of hostilities, all parties must stay rational. I think part of the problem with most wars is that uh, uh, people become so emotional and so committed. Uh, that's why I, I am uh, persuaded that the uh, contact group proposed uh, by uh, Ischinger is not going to get anywhere because the contact group he proposes is all, is all European. And all the Europeans uh, are anti-Russia. And all Europeans are applying sanctions against Russia. So that is not necessarily a group that is going to propose something that will be acceptable to the Russians. So the proposal of President López Obrador is to have uh, a group of people who will work out some kind of a plan of action and that group should be made up only of countries that have no interest uh, in the outcome uh, of this war and uh, he has uh, Lopez Obrador you know he has proposed of course uh, Mexico together with Brazil uh, with India uh, India is again being mentioned very often in all of these proposals, uh, whether it be Pope Francis or whether it be uh, Lula, uh, they're all referring to the responsibility of uh, India, soon the largest country in the world by population. Uh, I mean, they have a stake in this because if there's a nuclear war, obviously the Indians are going to suffer like everybody else. So, uh, India should play an important role here. Indonesia has been mentioned, uh, of course, uh, China, etc., etc. So it's not only uh, the Western uh, point of view that can be taken into account. You have to look at what is called the Global South and what the Global South uh, is proposing. Now, let, I only read the first uh, three. Uh, uh, of the uh, Chinese uh, uh, proposals. But then uh, they're talking about here the uh, on the resumption uh, of uh, uh, peace talks with the support of the international community, which should remain committed uh, to uh, this uh, approach uh, of facilitating some kind of a quid pro quo. Let's not forget uh, Kennedy did not win the dispute with Khrushchev in October uh, 62. I mean, that was a clear quid pro quo. The United States agreed to take its missiles out of Turkey, and uh, Russia agreed uh, to take them out of Cuba. So um, you have to give and take. You cannot just... Uh, expect to have winner takes all and uh, of course horrendous war crimes have been committed as someone who worked very closely with Sharif Basuni uh, in Chicago when I was uh, actually when he came to Geneva to head uh, the uh, Security Council working group to draft the statute of the uh, International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Uh, I went uh, to replace him uh, in Chicago, and uh, I, we actually wrote a book together: uh, "Human Rights and the Administration of uh, uh, Criminal Justice." And uh, in any event, I discussed this uh, with uh, Sharif for years. Uh, the you know importance. Uh, of uh, retributive justice and the importance of the concept of deterrence. On the other hand, uh, when have we had, um, uh, shall we say, the big war criminals punished? Certainly in Nuremberg. But of course the Russians were not punished in Nuremberg. The Russians uh, were not punished for anything that they did to the Ukrainians. And um, let's not forget, 
it's not just the polo domo uh, that they uh, are responsible for in the 1930s. And I think the uh, column, uh, the uh, statistics, I mean, the estimates, because nobody knows how many people were killed. The estimates go up to 8 million. You mentioned four, so you are conservative in the number of victims. But the, uh, it's, it, I, I have read uh, 8 million deaths attributed uh, to the Holodomor. But of course, what else did uh, Stalin do? He actually ordered the uh, execution, the murder, uh, of the 15,000 officers, the Polish officers, uh, uh, only 5,000 uh, were on earth uh, in Katyn, which is known as the Katyn Massacre. But the other 10,000, they're in some mass grave somewhere in Poland or in the Ukraine, but in any event, nobody knows where, they, where their uh, bones are lying today. Russia was not taken. Uh, <laughs> Uh, was not uh, punished uh, for the crimes committed against prisoners of war, uh, whether Polish or German. And uh, I wrote a book on uh, the Wehrmacht War Crimes Bureau, which was the war crimes office <coughs> of the uh, Wehrmacht, which collected uh, evidence on uh, war crimes by the Americans, the French, the Yugoslavs, the British, etc., and the Russians, of course. And, uh, of course, Nuremberg only punished the defeated. And uh, the International Criminal Court hitherto uh, has only indicted Africans. They have not indicted, uh, say, Tony Blair in connection with the aggression of the war crimes and crimes against humanity committed in Iraq. And uh, in five days, on the 20th, of March, we will be remembering the 20th anniversary of that unholy war against uh, the uh, Iraqi people. Something that had zero, zero justification, no provocation whatever on the part of Saddam Hussein, who was cooperating with the Security Council because two inspectors of the Security Council, Hans Blitz, and uh, Mohammed El Baradai were in Baghdad uh, investigating and always saying, but we don't find any weapons of mass destruction. And uh, notwithstanding that, it became quite clear uh, to uh, Kofi Annan that the United States was going to hit. So uh, at the last minute, they withdrew Hans Blix uh, and Mohammed El Baradai. Otherwise, uh, they would have uh, perished in shock and awe. So that was a horrendous war crime. Kofi Annan called it an illegal war, of course. And uh, there was also the torture and the use of uh, uh, prohibited weapons and uh, depleted uranium, etc. And uh, uh, cluster bombs uh, used in, um, in Iraq. No one was ever held to account. Why? Because usually you only get uh, uh, brought uh, before the tribunal if you lost the war or if you are an African leader who has been ousted from office. And then if you're no longer in power, uh, you're vulnerable. So that actually takes away uh, from the uh, authority and the credibility of uh, international criminal law. I mean, I would like to see uh, George Walker Bush uh, in the dock. I would have liked to see Donald Rumsfeld in the dock, but he's dead. I would have liked to have seen uh, Paul Wolfowitz in the dock and all of those who conspired uh, in that particular war crime. And today, by the way, uh, 15 years ago, uh, exactly 15 years ago, the so-called civil war uh, in Syria began. And uh, of course, it's not a civil war. It is a proxy war. Everybody's in there. Uh, the Israelis bombard Syria on a regular basis. Of course, violation of international law in total impunity. So that is a problem, the generalized problem of impunity. So as much as I would like to see uh, Putin punished, 
I don't see that happening. I really don't. Because as I said, if you push uh, a cat against the wall, he's going to jump at you. If you push him in the corner, he's going to jump at you. And if Putin felt himself existentially in danger, I have little doubt that he would press the button. Mm -hmm. And I just don't want to uh, push a cat uh, into the corner. And uh, there's something I talked about commonalities. Uh, there's a very nice sentence that I uh, draw from the speech of uh, Kennedy uh, in uh, 1963, uh, six months before he was himself assassinated. In the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet we all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future. And we are all mortal. Uh, I mean, I think uh, you can get the, uh, the speech in the internet very easily. JFK, commencement address, American University, 10 June 1963. It is absolutely a beautiful speech. And um, again, I... We'll have to stop here, but you're welcome to ask questions about the various uh, peace proposals. As I say, uh, our school is a school for diplomacy and international relations. It's a school for realpolitik with ethics. Ethics is really part and parcel of our commitment. Uh, and I would like to say it is a school that should teach us negotiating and mediation skills so as to uh, get out of uh, these uh, crises. And if you allow me to cite from uh, the only rules-based international order we have, the UN Charter. The UN Charter tells us in Article 2, Paragraph 3, that uh, all members shall settle their international disputes by peaceful means in such a manner that international peace and security and justice are not endangered. Now, Article 2, Paragraph 3 does not stop with the opening of hostilities. It's still valid. That is, uh, there is a positive obligation to settle our disputes by peaceful means, in any event, to try, in good faith, to sit down and say, okay, we've done horrible things, but let's try to stop the killing because every day another uh, 500, 1,000 soldiers are going to die and civilians, etc., etc., and then let's try to concentrate on humanitarian assistance. That is, by the way, something I've discussed recently with Niels Meltzer. Niels Meltzer used to be the rapporteur on torture, and he's now the chief legal officer at the International Committee of the Red Cross. So he is uh, heading that. And I know that the International Committee of the Red Cross, in its very discreet manner, engages uh, in mediation to the extent possible. They're very, very diplomatic. Uh, you'll never hear anything in the press about it because they're afraid that if they come and denounce, that then they won't be able to help the prisoners of war anymore. They won't have access to the prisoners of war. So uh, I think it is important to realize that there are many people of goodwill, including Pope Francis, uh, who are very keen on um, uh, settling this, and I just read, this is uh, an article from the 12th of March. Uh, Pope Francis says, a trip to Moscow is not impossible. You know, he's a globetrotter. He loves traveling. <laughs> so he's already spoken, you know, with Putin and with uh, Zelensky over video, video conferencing. But the idea, uh, he says, of course, if he goes to Moscow, he's going to go to Kiev also. He wants to actually use uh, the uh, Vatican 
as a uh, medium uh, to reach uh, some sort of a uh, uh, settlement. So having said that, I stop because I'm sure there are plenty of questions from the floor. Thank you. I can see that there are many hands there in the table we started. So what we'll do is then I call out to you, you stand up, ask your question, and t tell the name of the person to who you are asking the question. Okay? okay. So Go ahead. Thank you, everyone. For well, so anyone can feel free to answer this question. Um, I wrote it down because I know I'll get sidetracked if I don't write it down. So basically, I'd just like to ask Ivan Ilyin, a prominent Russian philosopher, basically claimed that the world was made in sin and that the world was made in sin because of man's conflicting ideas and passions and dogmas, um, which leads to unrest. Um, he insisted, however, that the Russian people were unlike the rest of the world, unlike the rest of the sin in the world. Um, and so they were not overcome by conflicting dogmas and passions, and they were rather unified in a common cause, which is the Vaj, I don't know if I said that correctly, the leader. Uh, the motherland, which consists of ethnic homogeneity, and um, essentially, I think it was God also, of course. Um, so the Russian state, and supposedly the Russian people, therefore fear the loss of any of these uh, principles, and they fear the permeance of other ideologies in Russia, which gives them the pretext and the excuse of defending God's creation against anyone who infringes on this, whether it be the West or any other entity. So, Basically, my question is, would you say that this sort of belief has been and will remain ingrained in the customs of Russian politics from this point forward? Or has it been? Thank you very much. I did not um, hear well the name of the philosopher, but anyway, I've heard the question. That's the most important way. You know, uh, you should join our class on Russian uh, history that we have now, and uh, we are discussing exactly the identity, mentality of Russian, etc., etc. But you know, to be a little bit more concise, I don't think that Russians should have absolutely analogous mentality than imaginary Europeans, because if I will say Greek and Swedish, all of them Europeans, but they have different mentality, you would agree with that, I guess. And we can find the similar pairs in different parts of the world. People and nations are created through ages and uh, uh, centuries by the conditions in which they live. Not only, of course, then history, then cultural layers, all create special thinking, habits, traditions, etc., etc. If you will ask me, are Russian different? Yes. They are different from, uh, let me say, Swiss, but they are not more different than I don't say, say uh, let us say, uh, than uh, Bulgarians and uh, Finland and Finland. They're also different, and the distance is roughly the same. Russia has been part of the Europe since its early history, and then he had uh, uh, it had uh, uh, how you call it uh, by. Uh, by uh, polar identity problem. That's the fact. And this is like a pendulum. Sometimes paternalistic tradition takes over and Russia returns to its traditional values, like now we are watching this period exactly. But occasionally, and it happened many times, people the in the great, uh, I don't know, Alexander the first and many, many others. Uh, by, by the way, the revolution has been started with these ideas. Then 
was returned back to the traditional approach. Then perestroika, again, totally different thing. And in 20 years, it returned to the... It's like two souls living in one person. Are we, uh, can I just add to that? Yes. I can't match that uh, brilliant answer. And, uh, so I'm just adding to it. <clears throat> you mentioned pendulum. Yes. In my observation, uh, pendula, which I think is the plural of pendulum, are of different length. So some of them are very small and move very quickly. And some move very, very slowly, and they're very large. And I say that because uh, that large pendulum that moves very slowly is usually well balanced between good luck and bad luck. And one of the sad things is that Mr. Putin has had a lot of good luck. That large, slow pendulum is now moving towards uh, bad luck, and I don't see, frankly, him um, emerging from a series now of bad luck. But I also agree with Professor Desires. We have to be thinking, which is what I've been doing in my career, of mediating. There's an apocryphal story, probably apocryphal, of a, two tribes that fought for generations and generations wars over a forest until somebody discovered that one tribe was interested in the forest for its wood. And the other tribe was interested in the forest for its leaves and medicinal uh, aspects. That was the end of the war. Um, so the classic approach of the mediator is to find common ground, in this case between Ukraine and Mr. Putin. But as Professor Likertel uh, mentioned earlier before we started the meeting, unfortunately, it's not just Putin. He has some very crazy hardliners around him. But there can be ways in finding a common ground because I don't think uh, the crooks around Putin are as fanatical as he is to see this all the way to the end. And they are very much interested in money and influence and so on. And there can be ways of finding common ground between them in Putin's entourage and uh, the uh, desires of the Ukrainian people and President Zelensky. That is feasible, I would think. No doubt uh, the easiest way out is if uh, Vladimir Putin would suffer cardiac arrest. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you can't you know, expect that that will happen. <laughs> and my worry is actually that if he were to disappear, that uh, the former president, Medvedev, is even more radical than Putin is. Medvedev has said things that would indicate to me that he would be more trigger happy uh, than Putin. So uh, unless you can uh, eliminate uh, the whole uh, leadership, the whole nomenclatura, uh, you're going to have a continuation or an aggravation of the current situation. And that's why I am in favor of uh, employing all mediating skills in order to convince them that it is ultimately in everybody's interest uh, to uh, stop the war. Now, uh, there was a peace manifesto a month ago issued by uh, Sarah Wagenknecht and Alice uh, Schwarzer uh, in uh, Germany. And it was signed actually by very, very prominent people, uh, uh, politicians, and even artists. I don't know, you're much too young to know Reinhard May, but I am a fan of a uh, troubadour, a German singer, a chansonnier called uh, Reinhard May. He's also one of the uh, co-signatories. Uh, as a case, maybe there's one line in the manifesto that I particularly like, you know, in order to get out of this stalemate. 
uh, to consider that negotiating does not mean surrendering. I mean, people hesitate uh, to negotiate because they think that is is tantamount to a surrender. Well, it, it really is not. And uh, in the American context, uh, one another troubadour that I like a lot and. Uh, 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 some of you probably do know his songs, just don't know that it's from him, uh, Bob Dylan. I mean, Bob Dylan uh, was, you know, one of my heroes at the time of the Vietnam War. And Bob Dylan had a lot of songs uh, uh, against uh, the Vietnam War. And I don't know whether I, I will find this. Uh, because it is a remarkable song that applies today. Uh, in this case, it, it was um, uh, associated with uh, uh, the uh, U.S.-Soviet uh, Union uh, conflict. Uh, and uh, uh, by the way, do you know that uh, Bob Dylan got the Nobel Prize for literature? Yeah. In 2016, you know, at that time I was president of the pen club here, and uh, I was not very happy because I had proposed in the name of our pen club, somebody else, uh, <laughs> Philippe uh, Jacoté. I don't know whether you know Philippe Jacoté. He passed away last year at the happy age of 92, and he's one of the very few people who has made it into La Pléiade in his lifetime. Usually you make La Pléiade, which is la crème de la crème of French literature, you make it after you're dead. Uh, so he actually made it uh, in, um, uh, in Lifetime. And uh, so I won't wait, I won't find the, the, the quote from uh, Dylan, but let's, uh, let's continue with more questions from the floor. You go. Stand up, introduce yourself, point out the person to who you want to ask the question. Hi. Uh, thank you for all of your um, all of your explanations. That was really interesting. Um, I wanted to dwell a bit more on the last question and that bring kind of a new um, perspective. So for me, what you were saying about mediation, for me, it's kind of like difficult to think when I believe that the fundamental problem of the war is more a bit more on the cultural side on the fact that um, Russia has uh, trouble believing of Ukraine as an entity uh, by itself, uh, but more of as an extension of, of, of Russia. Um, so I um, I don't think it's the same example of the forest, but maybe it's more like a householder with a rebel teenager going through a phase, if you allow me the metaphor. So um, I wanted to ask you to dwell more on the kind of like on the previous question and the sense that there's a cultural pre like the, I, for me I think that in the war there is um, a fundamental problem that goes before that which is the cultural notion of to what extent is Ukraine culture a thing Ukraine a, a thing of itself um, which I don't think it's um, which uh, I think it's problematic let's going get, in let's Russia. Let's get to the question. That's, that's the question. If you can ask, like if you can kind of like dwell a bit more on that, and what do you think about that? Well, perhaps I should pass this to Professor Literature, but my answer would be um, that it's very important when counseling or mediation that each side has access to the same information. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, too many Russians are getting all their information from television, even though the internet has been around for decades. Uh, and the television is owned and controlled by Putin. So if you get two parties into a room, they must at least have the same uh, access to the same information. Secondly, uh, all wars are um, asymmetric. In other words, one side thinks the war began last Wednesday, and the other side thinks it began 10 years ago. Like that neighbor has always been unpleasant, he's always been rude, he's always been difficult, 
So I slapped him on the ear last Friday. As far as he's concerned, that was unprovoked and the war started on Friday, whereas it's been going on for years. Um, role reversal is very uh, useful to put each side in the other's role and have them argue for it. Um, there is, of course, a Ukrainian language and a Ukrainian literature. Uh, but most uh, Russians that I see uh, interviewed in the street are not aware of, uh, they think that uh, Ukraine is being run by uh, Nazis and drug addicts and so on and so forth. So the first thing to do is to certainly get um, groups of people into the right kind of room together, and then it's going to take time. But cultural difference, um, it's good, as Professor Desire said, that somebody totally uninvolved, like the, from the Global South, be a mediator. Frankly, I think the Pope, who is a very holy and decent man, is a very bad diplomat. From, from the beginning, he's been saying, well, maybe Russia was provoked. And then somebody around him told him to shut up on that issue. So he has shut up on that. Um, but in any case, you need to uh, have access to the same information. The Russian people are intelligent. They're knowledgeable. If they start realizing more that Putin is controlling everything they're hearing, then you have a better chance for... Uh, but the cultural differences are there, but we're all part of the same human species, and both sides are perfectly capable of understanding each other. you have another question? Well, I found the quote, and I wanted to give you the quote from Bob Dylan. <coughs> uh, it's a long song, by the way, and it's, uh, it's in the internet, huh? And you do uh, uh, Bob Dylan, and then you, the name of the song is With God on Our Side. And it's fantastic. I won't tell you how the song ends, but I will just quote from this part. I've learned to hate the Russians all through my whole life. If another war comes, it's them we must fight to hate them and fear them, to run and to hide and accept it at all bravely with God on my side. And uh, it goes on and on. It has like about 10 strokes. And really, the point is at the end, so I leave it up to you to, uh, to find it in the internet. Uh, otherwise, uh, who knows Chris de Berg? I mean, I'm just giving you singers whom I like because they are of 40 years ago, 30 years ago, etc. And uh, has anybody in his head the little music of The Getaway? It's a great song. And he says, you know, uh, let's close them in a room and let them fight it out. Like, you know, put in Putin and Chalinsky in one room and let them fight it out, not us. Let's not sacrifice the youth. Let's not sacrifice uh, us people. What do we have? What does a Ukrainian uh, have against a Russian boy or a Russian boy against uh, a Ukrainian boy? I mean, uh, basically, we all want the same thing. We want peace. We want uh, good living. We want to have our, you know, families and our kids and everything. And we find ourselves pushed in a situation of uh, having to kill your neighbor. For those of you who have seen uh, uh, the movie uh, All Quiet on the Western Front, uh, the movie uh, of uh, the novel by uh, Erich Maria Remarque, uh, that's something that I strongly recommend uh, because uh, what's happened to Paul Boimer, who has been taught uh, that honor and glory is war. Honor and glory is fighting. And uh, I'm not so sure of that. I would say uh, more important uh, is to solve uh, the problems before they get that back. Next question, Dave. Go ahead. All right. Uh, thank you. So thank you very much for your presentation. It was extremely insightful and informational. Uh, not to keep Professor Desai speaking, but I have another question directed towards you, Professor. Uh, you, mentioned, <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the idea of not pushing the cat up against the wall because then the cat's going to fight back. Uh, as of about a month ago, on the 21st of February, uh, Putin announced that Russia was retracting from the New START Treaty in terms of controlling the amount of uh, weapons, essentially, um, 
in international interballistic weapons that it has. In your opinion, is the cap already being pushed up against the wall and we have to stop pushing? Or is it something that we're, is that cap being pushed up against the wall something we're still waiting for? Let's have Colm take it. <laughs> i tell you why, because I used to teach this nonsense yeah. called deterrence. Uh, can you imagine uh, the world lived uh, in peace for all those years because of mad mutual assured destruction? And one had to be uh, au fait and up to scratch in all of these things about second strike capabilities and nuclear triads, etc., etc. But the question is very pertinent. The prime uh, moral imperative is to avoid World War III. Yeah. But that doesn't mean peace at any price. It's been said of the ancient Romans that they lay waste to the land and call it peace. So do we want to go down a road where we live like Big Brother, under Big Brother, where we're under the control of uh, tyrants and dictators? Uh, where even your phone can spy on you? Or what do we do about the risk of nuclear war? I don't know the answer, but my guess, if I was in the terrible position of having to decide, which fortunately I'm not, I think Putin is bluffing. But if you play poker, you know that it's a tricky thing to decide the other person is bluffing. So I don't know the answer. Certainly withdrawing from this particular treaty and by the way, one of our professors who just retired, Professor Nazarkin, his signature is on the Star Treaty and the SALT mm -hmm. Treaty. Mm -hmm. And he taught arms control issues with us here. And we used to have every Wednesday a class where half of the students were here in Geneva and the other half were in Moscow discussing deterrence and submarine laws, launched missiles and all that sort of thing. Um, the entire thing is gross and immoral to imagine things like, uh, well, we were attacked first, so we will obliterate all of their population. But I don't know the answer. We're in a big high stakes poker game at the moment. My own view is that, is that uh, Putin is bluffing. Well, his entire life shows that he has used intimidation as a technique always intimidate the other. That's why he's interested in judo. He feels other, that others are always more powerful, stronger than him, richer than him. He resents them, and you must always intimidate them. So I don't know the answer to that, but his withdrawing from that treaty is definitely sent as a signal meant to intimidate. May I just yeah, absolutely, I agree. Two words. I agree. Well, uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to clarify a couple of things. Russia has not withdrawn from that treaty. Russia has suspended its participation in the treaty. And uh, the condition is that it is going to respect the treaty as long as the treaty is respected by the other side. In addition, I must say that we are in a much more certain situation with the nuclear weapons today because we have the cap for the warheads. And today it's absolutely clear and uh, uh, respected by all sides. It's 1,500 warheads. What suffices? Yeah. Huh? No, no, very <laughs> well. Well, in, in the past we had more than 5,000 each. Oh, mm -hmm. So it's much less than it was before. And uh, the problem is the delivery vehicles, of course. It, it has always been. But I would say that for Russia, this is the bigger problem than for the United States today, because I'm not going to technical detail, details, how they are served, what is the cycles of maintenance of the delivery vehicles, but believe me, according to uh, the knowledge, to information that you, you could find in uh, open sources, uh, all the satanas, all, all the missiles of Russia of that period of time have not been serviced properly. That means that the bulk of them, maybe from 40 to 60 percent, are totally obsolete beyond any repair. That does mean that the rust is insufficient 
for any strategic target or uh, goal. But I'm just saying what it is. Russia has not withdrawn. It is a political gesture. And in fact, it does not have any military consequences, in my judgment. Uh, we're coming to the end, I think. We have a question over here. Yes, go ahead. Yes. I am Mihai Kika, uh, former Secretary of State uh, in the Government of Romania. I have uh, one remark and two small questions. Um, first remark, um, I would like to thank to Professor Likota. Uh, listening to you, I have to say that um, my view is that we have been very lucky to have uh, you and bright diplomatic minds in the Kremlin for six years that have changed the face of Europe and um, the destiny of Eastern Europe. Um, I cannot compare the six years of Gorbachev to the 20 of, of Putin. And uh, that being said, uh, the question to you, Professor Likotal, is um, I know from a former Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Romania that uh, talking to Lavrov, Lavrov was, uh, again, on a private talk. Uh, very open to him to say that the the way they see uh, Russia is that they should get whatever it means uh, to the to the delta of the Danube. Then they 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 see Odessa, uh, Ukraine, and Moldavia as a part of a territory they want to, to control. And their view is that they do not perceive states, but they perceive territories. Uh, that's on one point. And the second point he was making was that uh, they often escalate in order to be, have the space to escalate uh, in negotiations. So, so how do you look at it? That's my, my first question. And uh, uh, my second question to, to uh, Dr. Murphy, uh, it's about the, the recent declaration of yesterday of Ron DeSantis, uh, which is a strong candidate. Uh, to be the next president of the U.S., uh, saying that uh, the U.S. shouldn't be more entangled into the Ukrainian war. And that, if we put it together with the view of President Trump, how do you view what's, what would be the, the risk of having a Republican president, one of the two, in one year and a half, which is not so far away? Uh, thank you very much for the question, but while I was listening to your second one, I forgot the first. <laughs> <laughs> that is a one word reminding the subject. Yeah, so, so um, what about the view of Russia today, that they have around them territories and not states, mm -hmm. and the fact that they escalate always to be on top of the conflict in order to, to, to have the, the first hand, let's say. And the other question about the Sanders, uh, just to comment to, uh, uh, to what uh, Professor Likotel said, then the question, and then we have one last question online, and then we must terminate today. Uh, yes, after that particular meeting, uh, Putin said, the thing George doesn't understand, meaning George Bush, is that Ukraine is not a country. Really? How does the guy look in the mirror every day when all the countries in the world recognize Ukraine as a country? And every leader who comes into office thinks, I'll do this and this and this and this and this. And then they learn that they have obligations. There are treaties and obligations that the country has entered into that the new leader is expected to continue with because the country has signed up to them. And in the negative sense, uh, Putin must be, should be aware of all the horrors committed by Stalin and others and feel and know that he owes Ukraine, and that of course it is a country. But for him to say, what well, George doesn't understand is that Ukraine is not a country. What a phenomenally inflated ego. Um, DeSantis, disaster. The Republicans in the United States have been a disgrace for many years. And if DeSantis gets the nomination, at least it's better than Trump. Uh, it does endanger the continuation of aid to Ukraine. First of all, two things in the military relations. I do not know the answers. At the end of this session, can we say, oh, everything is suddenly clearer? Well, we've 
we've learned some things perhaps, but I certainly don't have the answers. But my intuition in terms of what I've been doing all my life is that May, will, the month of May will be very important. And it'll be important to continue while Biden is in office. And yes, we can actually sit down and negotiate with Putin, but only when Zelensky uh, gains more on the battlefield. My intuition, which may be incorrect, is that when Putin is pushed a little harder, he must not be pushed so far that he pushes the nuclear button. But if he's pushed a little harder, he'll have to choose between staying in power or talking. And so the month of May and June are very important. And that's why I'm in favor of more weapons reaching um, Ukraine faster. Now we have one last question online, last question. and then we'll terminate. Yes, uh, our new student, uh, Eve, would like to know if you have any comments on the attempts of opening up multiple fronts around the Russian border and extending the conflict beyond the Ukrainian front. Anyone open up what around the border? Uh, various, multiple fronts, military fronts around is the Russian border. For that, or is he worried well, do you about have it? any comment on that? Eve, Eve is asking whether you have any comments on... Eventual... Yes, we absolutely have to think very seriously about de-escalation. Uh, it sounds weird, but I think that uh, my own wish is that Jelinski gains a few uh, more victories first and then sits down and talk. But it's a delicate and dangerous line, and we must absolutely uh, try to avoid other fronts opening up. Otherwise, we sleepwalk into World War Three, rather in the way that World War One. Happened. Um, I'm sorry that we don't have all the answers, but you've been very patient and a very good audience, etc., etc. I think we've opened up uh, certain things that um, should have been opened up, and I think we all uh, agree that this is a tragic war. People are dying even now as we speak, and um, one's heart goes out, especially to the Ukrainian people, but also to all those young Russian boys who have been thrown into the front lines and to their certain deaths. Thank you all for being here and see you next time. With that, we finished yeah. the event, so we'll see you the next time in New Hampshire Military. Have a good evening, everyone.